we're talking about that age-old question, uh, why? <laughs> why are you here on the earth? Why do you exist? Why did you come into existence? Is there any point or purpose to your life? Is there any reason for your being here? Or are you just a chance speck uh, thrown up uh, by some wild cosmic clashing of a atoms or protons or neutrons billions of years ago and you will appear like a star for a brief moment and then die out and never be heard of again? Or is there some point in you being here? And what we have been talking about is the explanation given by a remarkable uh, human being who lived uh, in the first century of our present era. And that was, of course, that man, Jesus. And he explained that the creator of the world was his father. And indeed, he was very different from other people who claim to be God or claim to be the son of God because they are usually the kind of people that you expect to see in a psych ward. Uh, they're utterly unbalanced and they're unbelievable, but he has always been looked upon as the most balanced character that ever lived. We, even those of us who don't believe in him, uh, try to get our children to imitate the balance and the sanity of his thinking and his restraint and his honesty and his concern for others. And so he doesn't strike you as a fanatic or a psychotic at all. He strikes you as being real. And he, of course, said that he was the son of the maker of the universe. And he explained, as we mentioned yesterday, that the whole purpose in your being here was to begin to trust your father who made you, that is, the maker of the universe. He is really your father, and he actually knows you. And then, obviously, your life has purpose and has reason to it. But, of course, most of us have decided, no, we're not going to risk that kind of thing. We're not going to risk believing that some invisible creator knows why I'm here. I'm not going to chance that. I'm going to find out what I want to do with this life myself and uh, make what I can of it and uh, look at the world as my oyster and get what I need from it. Now, what we said yesterday, of course, was that we never would take that attitude when we join a company. We don't get into some little corner of the factory or get into our own little office and say, I'm not going to listen to the president of the company, I'm not going to listen to the boss, I'm not going to listen to the foreman or the manager, I'm just going to do what I want to do in this factory and I'm going to try to use the resources of it to get what I need in the way of money and food and clothing and uh, let the rest do what they want. We don't say that, not for a moment, because we all believe that the factory will in fact only benefit us if the general purpose of the factory is fulfilled, if it manufactures what it's meant to manufacture. In other words, unless we all join together in some kind of teamwork, we won't get a penny out of it. And so we, most of us, are utterly dependent on somebody telling us what to do and how we can fit into the whole scheme. And that is obviously the same situation here in the universe. Obviously, somebody knows why this whole thing was created. I mean, somebody knows why you were given the abilities. You have some abilities. You may sit there and say, oh, I have no ability, but you have. You have some things that you can do that others can't do quite the same way. Indeed, the amazing thing is that you're absolutely unique if you've ever thought about it. Even if you're an identical twin, you're still in some way different from your identical twin. You have an attitude to life and a way of thinking about things and a way of doing things that even your identical twin doesn't. And uh, if you're not an identical twin, of course, you're even more obviously unique. There's been nobody ever like you in the whole world. There never will be anybody like you in the whole world. You're a one-off. You're the only you that has ever or will ever exist. And the fact is that 
you can only fulfill the plan that was formed for you if you listen to the person who put you here with that plan in mind. But most of us, of course, don't do that. We say, forget it. I'm going to live my own life. I don't know if there's a God or not. I'm just going to concentrate on getting what I can in the way of food and clothing and uh, a shelter over my head that I can from this world. And uh, I'm going to make my own way in life. And that's, of course, what most of us do. The result is very frustrating. It's uh, uh, a great uh, futility that we meet because we find that the other five billion of us, there are five billion of us now, and the other five billion are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to get the food and the shelter and clothing that they need instead of depending on the creator of the world to keep his promise that he would add all those other things onto us if we would concentrate on finding out what he had put us here to do. Uh, we uh, instead... Uh, try to get all the food and shelter clothing we need, but the other five billion are doing the same. So it makes for quite a bit of competition. And so most of us live lives of worry and anxiety. Over what? Over uh, the big issues of life? No, over food, shelter, and clothing. That's it. Uh, it was old Auden, you remember, that said, in headaches and in worry, vaguely life leaks away. And that's true. Most of us leak life away and headaches and worry, and the headaches and worry are usually over how to get more money or more pounds, more dollars, uh, so that we can get uh, more permanent uh, life insurance or a better home or pay the mortgage off or get better clothes or get a better car or get a stack of food that will never run out. We are spending our lives usually trying to find those purely animal needs that uh, will just keep us alive. If you ever ask why we're staying alive, of course, uh, we would be forced to answer we're staying alive so that we can stay alive. We're staying alive so that we can get more money, so that we can keep ourselves alive a bit longer. And, of course, the, it's an absolutely vicious circle in, in our thinking. But most of us answer that way. And the amazing thing is that we don't even achieve the purposes that we set out to achieve because we never do somehow seem to get to a position of security. It's uh, incredible. But more especially those of us who live in the West, uh, we are probably some of the most insecure people in the whole world, in spite of the fact that we have more than everybody else has. We never somehow reach a point of security. Of course, the reason is that security comes not from us being able to grab enough food, shelter, and clothing, because we never can do that. And if we grab it, we can never ensure that somebody else won't take it away from us. But uh, security doesn't come from getting those things. Security comes from knowing that there is someone who has control of all those things and who has control of the distribution of them and that he cares about us and loves us and is concerned about us. That's where security comes from. In other words, the last time most of us had security was when we were five years old and we could trust our dad and mum always to supply us with lunch when we needed it. And that's really the only source of security. So most of us try to get the security from the world and from the things in it, from the money in it or from the food in it or from the homes in it or from the clothes in it, but we really never do manage to make that. And so we live in constant insecurity. Uh, of course, we feel very insignificant. There are five billion others who are equally unique and believe that they are unique, except that they're in the same position as us. Uh, they wonder why the rest of us don't see how unique they are. And of course, the rest of us don't see how unique they are because we're also preoccupied with our own uniqueness, which we're afraid may not be as unique as we think it is. In actual fact, it is, but our uniqueness comes not from all the others recognizing that we're unique, but from the maker of the world who made us unique. And of course, once we lose touch with him, we lose that sense of our own uniqueness. And so we spend our lives trying to make an impression on the world and trying to establish a little niche in the Hall of Fame for us so that somebody who didn't remember Bing Crosby, didn't remember John Wayne, doesn't really remember Churchill too well, will somehow remember us. Of course they never do. 
And so we end up in tremendous frustration, trying to get from the world of things and people what we were meant to get from the maker of the world himself. Let's talk a little more about that tomorrow.